the Pope. Arcanum 5 corresponds to the letter He of the Hebrew alphabet. The numerical value of this letter is 5. The hieroglyphic correspondence is breath. Breathing is the basis of the vital processes of the organism, hence its interpretation as the life, which is in accordance with the astrological correspondence of the Arcanum Aries, the zodiacal sign of the ram. The presence of the sun in the sign of Aries determines the first spring month, and spring is the yod element of the annual solar cycle. This period prepares the life of the year. It is the first breathing. Two questions immediately arise. If in the Tetragrammaton scheme, the hay corresponds to the feminine principle, what is there in common between the feminine principle and life? And secondly, the second arcanum, Beth, is also interpreted as the feminine principle. So because the same interpretation is applied to arcanum 5, what is the nuanced difference between the two? We will answer the first question by making a small foray into the field of Christian theosophy, both in the more modern 16th, 17th and 18th centuries, as well as in the older 14th and 15th centuries. If each dynamic cycle of the tetragrammaton type succeeds a similar cycle, whose yod is a transformation of the second He of the preceding cycle, then reversing the direction, we can consider that the yod of our initial cycle is a transformation according to the He of a previous cycle. The search for the elements of this cycle will be an ascent in the chain of causality, leading us to the knowledge of the new yod of the higher order, and to ask in the same question about the previous cycle. We can then retreat several times. The very initial cycle in a series of causations, or figuratively speaking, the first family of the quaternary type, of course cannot be considered absolutely independent, that is, not having predecessors in a number of elements of dynamic processes. After all, the beginning of all beginnings cannot have the name Yod, for the active element is animated by the desire, the need to fertilise, and the beginning of all beginnings must have the attribute of pleasure. This principle must be neutral, androgynous, embodying all the elements of those dynamic processes that it is able to generate. To symbolise this beginning, we will put an end to Yod by writing the scheme of the first quaternary transcendental region in the form of, it looks like a reverse tetragrammaton. This point will remind us of the great, incomprehensible, infinitely homogeneous, ideally bright, radiant beginning of Ein Sof in Hebrew of great Nirvana, the Hindus. This incomprehensible principle, unable to constitute the object of logical speculation, was manifested by the masculine element Yod, the impregnating, expansive, radiant element, which can be given the name of universal love. This universal love, delimited in itself passivity, attractivity, the feminine principle, that has a certain quality of shadow nature, the so-called restriction, whose name is universal life and impregnated with this. From the union of these elements, the higher yod and the higher he, the element of the vow of the first family is born. His name is Logos. The primary emanations of this element will be the second he of the first family and will transfer us already to the transcendental world of Olam Ha Atzaluth of the second family. This is why life has turned out to be a feminine element. In the writings of the abbot Trithemus, 1462 to 1516, are transmitted the modern Rosicrucian theories of the time, wherein the element Yod of the first family is called the superessential fire. The element He is called the superessential air, and the Logos is called the super-essential light. As we see, air, breath, was identified with the feminine element. It is easy to notice that the Rosicrucians considered this terminology and interpretation of the dogma of the Christian Trinity, with fire being its first person, air the third and light the second. 
The Kabbalistic world of Atzaluth in Trithemus appears under the name Spiritus Mundi, Spirit of the Universe. It seems to us that the above help gives an answer to the first question, and we move on to the second. The Arcanum Beth points to the feminine as something existing in the form of correspondence to the masculine, something to be studied, gnosis, cognition, something fundamentally necessary in the progression of the Arcana. The Arcanum of Hay is already the form in which the Arcanum of Beth is clothed, not more specifically than Beth. Beth outlines the feminine realm. Hay fills the sphere with something formally existing. In general, the higher the number, the more specific its value. Beth had a hieroglyphic mouth. Hay is the breath emanating from this mouth. Having given these explanations, we pass to the arithmological analysis of the arcanum. And these are five equals one plus four or 5 equals 4 plus 1, and 5 equals 3 plus 2, or 5 equals 2 plus 3. The first two decompositions of the five will give us headlines for the contents of the arcanum in the three areas of the theosophical ternary. For the archetype, one means the essence of the divine, four, the fundamental necessity of form. The element of radiance in the divine essence indicates the choice of a positive pole in the matter of evaluating the forms of mental manifestations. Forms that are not distorted by incorrect reflection and refraction will become synonymous with good. Distorted forms synonymous with the realm of evil. The arcana, in terms of the archetype, will interpret the tree of knowledge of good and evil with a conscious preference for good over evil. The title is Universal Magnetism, Sienti Boni e Mali. In terms of man, one is interpreted as Vir, an active fertilising element, and four as elements whose synthesis forms the human body, or as Octoritas, the secret of ethical dominance in the centre of the cross, which is the quaternary. In both cases, the fifth principle that controls their transmutation mysteriously adds to the fourth principles that exist in the outside world, which makes it possible to realise the great work. In alchemy, this fifth principle is called quintessence. This word will be the second heading. We will find the heading of the arcanum in the natural world if, through the external manifestations of the four elements of the fourth arcanum, we can see the nature and nature runs element of the first arcanum summed within the fourth. He who, through the contemplation of nature and deep meditation, perceives the unity behind the veil of the four external influences will attain the natural religion. Thus, the title of arcanum five in the nature plane will be religion. If in the deconstruction five equals one plus four, under the number four, we understand the world of the elements, and under the number one, the superior principle, conscious, conscious as explained, then the sum one plus four will symbolize the man, dominator of the elements, who has under control the impulses of his elemental nature. Putting four in first and one in second place, we will have the opposite, that is, the formula of an impulsive man, whose manifestations depend on external influences on his physical nature. Let us now turn to the second scheme of division of the number five into its components. Five equals three plus two means that Arcanum five is composed of upper and middle principles of the great Arcanum of magic, that is, of the metaphysical ternary three and the astral binary two. Thus presented, the Arcanum symbolizes the manifestation in the two higher planes of some entity whose metaphysical knowledge rules the astral mechanism. The following beings are capable of action in two planes. One, a white magician while doing work on the astral plane, even taking a point of support on the physical plane. Two, 
an elemental of the positive type, e.g. the men's and the human soul, united, studying with evolutionary purpose, the cliches, during the interval between two incarnations. 3. The egregores of the positive evolutionary type. 4. The spiritus directus, who form a superior policing in the astral plane, and so on. The opposite deconstruction, 5 equals 2 plus 3, symbolises the cover-up of the absolute truth of the Trinitarian law by the mirages of false astral cliches driven by involutive whirlpools. This deconstruction corresponds to the manifestations of tenebrous entities such as a slim dark man working in the astral, an elemental of the negative kind, for example the men's and the human soul united seeking misrepresented cliches during the interval between two incarnations in order to reincarnate, not to repair the karma, but to be able to return to physical enjoyment again. These entities are content to satisfy their desires in any other way, even if it is through mediums. Egregores of the negative type, which are involutive, and, and larvae, etc. The two deconstructions studied, 3 plus 2 and 2 plus 3, are respectively illustrated by the positions evolutionary and involutive or inverted of a geometric symbol of huge theoretical meaning and realising value, which is the pentagram. And he's got pictures of them face up and face down. In the evolutionary pentagram, 3 plus 2, it is customary to insert the human figure whose head, arms and legs form the pentagram. In the inverted pentagram, 2 plus 3, it is easy to insert a goat head, putting horns, ears and beard on the tips. This goat symbolises the devil, the father of lies, thus embodying the clichés of true manifestations, but deformed to the point of being no longer recognisable. Before proceeding with the pentagram, we will study the card of Arcanum 5. His erudite name is Magister Arcanorum, Master of the Arcana, that is, the Great Hierophant. His common name is the Pope. The image shows a man sitting. Upon his head we see the horns of Isis, and between them the full moon. The binary of the horns is dominated by the ternary of the cross of the Great Hierophant, which we see in Arcanum um, 4, which are fixed on the end of the staff that the man holds in his right hand. The staff is quite long, so that the cross stands well above the head, slightly inclined towards the Hierophant. The Hierophant's left hand extends over the heads of two figures kneeling before him. In some pictures, the gesture of the hand is a blessing. In others, it is a gesture of silence. In both cases, the gesture expresses a manifestation of the will of the two kneeling figures. One is lighter, one darker. The Hierophant is seated like the woman of Arcanum II, between the columns of Wakim and Boaz, with the traditional curtain between the two of them. Here as there, the talk of the columns is neutralised by a personality, but in figure five, the figure is masculine. The man is seated, which expresses the passive state, receptive to the teaching of binaries, but it is a male being, that is, an active being, who is adapting this teaching to life. In addition, his gesture expresses the will. This element of the will, enlightened by knowledge, this element of active, not inert power, is the main characteristic of the Arcanum 5 and its graphic symbol, the pentagram. The whole environment suggests initiation. The kneeling figure suggests that the pentagram, the magician, along with the forces of light, is triumphing over the forces of darkness, forcing them to serve higher purposes. He knows the great temporary ignorance of these elements and consequently their weaknesses. This allows one to use them for good, thus facilitating the future atonement of their errors. The following questions now apply. How will the man whose astrosome is vivified by the men's have the ability to perform the functions of the pentagram? How should one create this pentagram? A succinct enumeration of the trials to which those who seek initiation are subjected will first will answer the first question. The second we can reply by sketching a general plan of the astral, physical and mental training of the mage. We will soon. 
The initiation is of two basic types, that of white magic and that of black magic, according to what it serves. That is, to create a human being. Firstly, either aspiring to the good by the dedication to the good and despising one's own comforts or annoyances. Or two, enjoying evil by its own attraction to evil, even if it brings harm, enjoying the lie because of the attraction to the lie and the darkness because of the attraction to the darkness. In the two types of initiation, the first stages are similar. The neophyte must prove his or her one plus four, that is, demonstrate that he or she is not disturbed by dangers and surprises coming from the elements. Prove that they are not a coward on the physical plane, that they do not lose their head. In this stage is the traditional proofing of the fire that he or she must cross boldly without fear of burns in the trial. Then in the trial of the water, you need to swim through without being intimidated, even if the current is very violent. In the trial of the air, hanging on without fear and without dizziness. In the trial of the earth, whose depths must be penetrated without fear of being crushed by the dark vaults of the underground. The evidence from the second stage of trials is again similar in both types of initiation. They are astral trials concerning fear, passion and consciousness. The neophyte is proven through the fear that can be felt before horrible and even aggressive astral cliches that are presented. At the same time, the neophyte's sensitivity is artificial and temporarily increased. The second ordeal, that of passion, seeks to verify whether the neophyte is able to control his or her sexual desire, even if the conditions are the most conducive to their satisfaction. This ordeal is generally divided into two parts. One, to be able to oppose an approaching temptation. Two, to know not to take advantage of a victory obtained by the very effort in overcoming the indifference of the person of the opposite sex. The third odd ordeal, that of consciousness, is to demonstrate the ability to perform a particular job, fulfill a mission, keep a secret, or simply not give up despite enormous temptations and the full guarantee of impunity. Although these trials are equal in form in both types of schools, those of white magic and those of black magic, they are not the same in their essence and purpose. The white magician must not fear the most horrible cliches, for you will have to cross the world of them to reach the luminous principles. The black magician should not fear them either, for you will have to stay in touch permanently with horrible and repugnant manifestations. The white magician must be able to be firm in his chastity to be sure that he will not succumb when temptation appears. The black magician must only understand that self-control, even in certain moments of life, gives him, gives him advantages over those who do not possess such control. The white magician must always fulfil his accepted duties and obligations to become firmly in the service of the good. The black magician must only understand that having trained his firmness in the execution of a determined plan, he could do much more harm than acting at random and when opportunity arises. Black magicians sometimes grow through additional proof of dedication to evil, which we will not describe here. <laughs>